Today, I'd like to talk about turning around an epidemic. 100 million Americans right now do have either diabetes or prediabetes, and that puts them at risk for amputation, for heart disease, for blindness, and we're exporting this epidemic overseas. Now, the word epidemic comes from Old Greek. Epi means on, demos means people, so an epidemic is something that we study with sterile statistics and maps and graphs, but the truth is it's something that impinges directly on people, on living, breathing human beings. My father did not like the cattle business, so he left, left the family farm, and he went to medical school. And he spent his life at the Fargo Clinic treating diabetes. He became the diabetes expert for the whole region, and I have to say, my father really was, was frustrated because patients were given diets that they did not like. What we would say is, or what they would say is, diabetes is a condition where there's too much sugar in your blood. So don't eat anything that turns to sugar. So don't eat bread, don't eat fruit, don't eat pasta, don't eat rice, don't eat sweet potatoes, don't eat regular potatoes, don't eat beans, don't eat carrots. All these things had to be limited, and while you're at it, cut calories. And that's what people were supposed to adhere to. That gets old by Wednesday. Patients were also given medicines and they were given needles and instruction on how to stick their fingers and how to inject insulin. And despite all of this, diabetes never got better. It always progressed. And it then became something that we were exporting overseas. And when I got out of medical school, we had more medicines. And I think we had sharper needles. But to tell you the truth, it was the same sort of result. We had unhappy patients, and, and, and we, we never, ever cured this disease. It never turned around. It was always considered a progressive disease. But there were two scientific discoveries that really turned all of this, this around. And the first one was taking the widest possible lens. If you look around the world at those countries that have the least diabetes, like Japan, for example, they weren't following anything like the diet that we were giving to diabetic patients. We, they weren't saying, gee, I'm not going to eat rice, I won't eat noodles. They eat this, this kind of food all the time. It's front and center on their plate. And the second discovery came from looking inside the cell, especially the muscle cell. And the reason we look at muscle cells in particular is that's where glucose is going. That's where blood sugar is going. That's the fuel that powers your movement. You, you know about a person who's running a marathon? What are they doing in the weeks leading up for it? They, they're they're carbo-loading. So they're eating pasta and they're eating bread to try to get that glucose into the cell for energy. And that is the problem in diabetes. Because glucose, glucose is there outside the cell trying to get inside. In order to get in, it needs a key, and that key is insulin. Now, what if I get home, and I'm getting up to my front door, and I take my key out of my pocket, I put it in the front door. Wait a minute. It's not working. And there's nothing wrong with my key. But I look in the lock, and while I was gone, somebody put chewing gum in my lock. So what am I going to do? Crawl in and out the, the window? No. I'm going to clean out the lock. Well, when a person has diabetes, their insulin key is not working. Why would that be? Why could insulin not signal this? What's supposed to happen is the glucose is supposed to enter into the cell. And glucose is the key that makes that happen. But the reason it doesn't happen, it's not that there's chewing gum inside the cell. What there is is fat. Fat. Little globules of fat. Now, I have to say, doctors hate words like fat. It's got one syllable. So we want to call it <laughs> intramyocellular lipid. Um, intra means inside. Myo means muscle. Cellular means cellular. Lip, lipid, <laughs> lipid means fat. Intramyocellular lipid is fat inside your muscle cells. And that is what interferes with insulin's ability to work like a key to signal glucose coming in. Now, in 2003, the National Institutes of Health gave my research team a grant and said, let's test something completely different. Instead of limiting breads and all of these kinds of things, what if, if fat is the issue, what if we have a diet that has effectively no fat in it? Well, where does fat come from? It comes from two sources, animal products, animal fat, and vegetable oils. So we brought in 99 people. And we asked them to do two things, to really eat a bounty of food, not worrying about quantity. We're not counting calories here. We are not counting carb grams or anything like that. What we're doing instead 
is we're setting the animal product aside, keeping the vegetable oils low. Very simple. Now, one of our participants was a man named Vance. And Vance's father was dead by age 30. Vance was 31 when he was diagnosed with diabetes. He was in his late 30s when he came to see us. And he said, this is not hard. Unlike every other diet he'd been on, we didn't care how many carbs he ate or how many calories or how many portions. If he was having chili, not a meat chili, it would be a bean chili, chunky vegetable chili. If he was having spaghetti, instead of a meat topping, it would be topped with artichoke hearts and wild mushrooms and chunky tomato sauce and that kind of thing, very, very easy. Over a course of about a year, he lost 60 pounds. His blood sugar came down and down and down. And one day his doctor sat him down and said, Vance, I know you've had family members die of this disease, but as I look at your blood tests, you don't have it anymore. And can you imagine what that feels like to have family members who felt this was absolutely a one-way street and to have this disease just turn around? And when I asked Vance's permission to tell you about his story, he said, make sure you tell everybody that my erectile dysfunction went away too. <laughs> okay, write that down. Okay. So, we published our findings in peer-reviewed journals. The American Diabetes Association now cites it and accepts, it, accepts this as an effective approach. And people around the world started using this. And I heard from a man in England who wanted to let me know about his experience. He had had diabetes, tried all kinds of diets without a lot of success. And then he heard about our approach, tried it for several weeks, went to the doctor. The doctor drew a number of blood tests. And he got home. The phone rang. It's the doctor's office. Could you come back? right now. So he, good heavens, what's in my blood test? And he races into his car and he's driving to the doctor's office thinking, what disease did they discover on my blood test? What did they find? And he runs into the doctor's office. They say, we need to sit down. Explain exactly what you've been doing. All traces of his diabetes were gone. The doctor said, your blood test tests are better than mine and I don't have diabetes. How is this possible? The doctor explained to him that we can never say that a person has been cured of diabetes because we all know that's not possible. But technically, it's not there. And the doctor was skeptical. He said, come back in two months. I want to test you again. Never came back. Now, wait a minute. Diabetes is genetic, right? It runs in families. And there, in fact, are genes for diabetes. But this is an important thing to remember. Genes are in two categories. Certain genes are dictators. I'm talking about the genes that say blue eyes or brown hair. They are dictators. They give orders. You can't argue. But the genes for diabetes are committees. They're making suggestions. And you could say, well, wait a minute. I don't really think I want to have diabetes. And in fact, most disease genes, whether it's for heart disease or diabetes or hypertension, certain forms of cancer, even Alzheimer's disease, they're not dictators, they're committees. And they are, their activity depends on what we put into our bodies.